Hey everyone, Nick Espinosa, your chief security fanatic here, and today I want to talk about deep fakes because deep fakes are ramping up their sophistication, and that is going to spell trouble for all of us, especially in the middle of an election cycle. And here's what's going on. Now, this is coming from Reuters, and I found this to be absolutely fascinating and terrifying. And to begin, we're going to be talking about a freelance writer named Oliver Taylor, and uh, you probably haven't heard of him, but he is published. Now, he is also a student at uh, England's University of Birmingham, and his online profiles are what you would expect. He's a coffee lover, a politics junkie. Uh, he was raised in a traditional Jewish home, according to him, and he's done about half a dozen freelance editorials and posts um, that basically show that he writes about things like anti-Semitism and Jewish affairs and all of that, and he has bylines in the Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, the Al Jaminer, and some others. Now, here's the thing. He appears to be a deep fake creation and he doesn't actually exist, at least that's what it appears to be, even though he's getting published in major Israeli publications and elsewhere as well. The University of Birmingham has no record of him. Really, this is what's going on. He has no obvious online footprint beyond an account uh, of the question and answer site Quora. He was basically active there for two days in March, but he has basically no online presence whatsoever until he started writing articles and getting published in late December of 2019. Now, both the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel that published his work said that they have tried and failed to actually confirm his identity. Now, the editors at the Jerusalem Post and the Al Jaminer say that they published Taylor after he pitched them basically over email. He pitched these stories over email and they accepted. He didn't ask for payment, they said, and he, they actually didn't actually take any uh, really do anything to try to vet his identity at all. Now, calls to his UK or his published UK phone number that he gave to the editors basically had an automated error, it doesn't exist, and he didn't respond to emails to his Gmail account when Reuters actually reached out trying to get in contact to communicate with Oliver Taylor or whoever runs Oliver Taylor. So by virtue of this, uh, Reuters took the image that Taylor was using for his bylines and, and his very small social media presence and basically ran it through six experts and they determined it was a deep fake. Now, uh, digital, uh, basically the digital forensics, uh, image forensics pioneer, uh, Hanny Farid, basically, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, said, and I quote, the distortion and inconsistencies in the background are a telltale sign of a synthesized image and are a few as are a few glitches around his neck and collar. So that obviously is a very huge tell. Now there's another person, uh, Mario or Mario Klingeman, um, who also uses deep fake in his work. And he said that this photo has, and I quote, all the hallmarks, I'm 100% sure that it's a deep fake. So that is obviously a huge, huge issue. Now here's why this came to light. In an article um, in the U.S. Jewish newspaper, the Al Jaminer, Taylor had accused a London-based academic, uh, Mazen Masri, and his wife, who is a Palestinian rights campaigner, Rivka Barnard, of being, and I quote, known terrorist sympathizers. Now, they were taken, those two were taken aback by the allegation, which they obviously denied, but they were also just really puzzled as to why this writer, who is a university student supposedly, would actually single them out. Masri said that he pulled up Taylor's profile photo and he couldn't put a finger on it, he said, but the man's face seemed kind of off. And so he contacted Reuters and here we are. Now, after Reuters began asking about Taylor, the Al Jaminer and the Times of Israel actually deleted his work. Taylor emailed both papers, interestingly enough, or whoever is quote unquote Oliver Taylor. He emailed both of those papers protesting the removal but the Times of Israel uh, opinion editor Miriam Hirschlag said that she rebuffed him after he failed to prove his identity. So she basically said, if you can prove who you are and we know who you are, we'll put it right back up there because there have been rumors of you being a deep fake. He could not do that. And so they kept it down. The Jerusalem Post and another publication he's been published in, the Arutz Sheva, have kept his articles online, although they removed the terrorist sympathizer reference following that complaint from uh, Masri and his wife. Uh, the Post editors-in-chief, Yakov Katz, um, did not actually respond to Reuters to say whether the work would stay up or not, but obviously it's still online as I'm talking to you here. And so by virtue of all of this, it looks like there's a disinformation campaign that was getting published in uh, multiple Jewish newspapers, and that obviously is very concerning because it could be happening everywhere. So this begs the question, who or what organization 
is masquerading as Oliver Taylor as Oliver Taylor and getting published and obviously what is the end goal here with what they are doing nobody seems to know at the moment but it really underscores a serious issue we have with disinformation now this could be let's say uh, another writer uh, you know in the Jewish community that doesn't want his 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 or her name known and so they make up this fake persona it could be a state sponsored campaign it's obviously very sophisticated in the sense that uh it's it's you know, they got this deep into these publications. So, for example, if I have a political agenda or I'm against something or, or even for it and I have the ability to write, which I personally like to think I do, given that I've published articles, uh, you know, in publications, it's scary just thinking that I could create a fake identity Find a publication out there or a major publication in a community or a country or whatever that is, and they'll publish it. And there we go. And I could be literally making things up or talk, talking in hyperbolic terms, to put it nicely, and all of that. And I'm going to find somebody that is going to publish my work. And I understand the need for a pseudonym, but oftentimes the pseudonym is shown to the public, whereas the publication, the editors, you know, if I'm writing a book, uh, you know, and I am pretending to be whatever my pseudonym is, my publisher is going to know that I, it's me, Nick Espinoza, and, and that is my pseudonym. I mean, that's typically how those things kind of work. This is not some random person on Facebook spouting off conspiracy theories. These are newspaper editors here, and they have a vetting process, and that vetting process failed, and they should have a vetting process. And so I think this really underscores just how important it is to fact check everything you read. I think if you're going to be published, uh, you should ha go through a vetting process for any publication that is legitimate, that, that will ver verify your identity. And if they verify your identity and you say, I want to have a pseudonym, if they're fine with that, I really don't care. But this is a situation where nobody could confirm this guy's identity. And so by virtue of that, who is it? Is it state sponsored? Is it some you know random person that doesn't want to be identified? It is very important, but I also think it's also important that as we are reading these kinds of articles, that we are fact-checking these things because we don't know necessarily who's writing them. Now, some writers are very well known. They go through the vetting process. You know, you can see them on TV as pundits or whatever it is when they publish, let's say, a lengthy research article where they've taken the time to do all of this. But an Oliver Taylor that is getting published in multiple publications isn't that. So... I think that's very important. I think as we come up to an election year here in 2020, this upcoming election that now I think is only like, what, four months away, five months away? It's like a, it's a few months away here. Just this quarantine feels like forever. We're going to see a ramp up of these kinds of things. And it's not going to be for the benefit of us. It's going to be to drive a wedge. It's going to be to solidify confirmation bias. And I think that's something that we really need to uh, really understand and address society wide and really educate people to say, look out of your confirmation bias, look at both sides of the story. I don't care if you're you're conservative or liberal or whatever you are. It, it, it behooves us to get that perspective on everybody and make an informed decision, not just find somebody that's spouting off whatever that seems to agree with you. And I think we are seeing a rash of that, which is then undermining legitimate journalists and those that are actually doing their job. So I think that's important. And that, by virtue of it being important, is your news of the day. And please like, share, follow me here on Facebook and Twitter at Nick AESP. And please feel free to subscribe to me at YouTube as well. And as always, stay safe and stay online. Thanks, everyone.